All right, welcome to the Pierce College Studios. Uh, today we're going to go ahead and have a little tutorial. We're going to address how to stretch a canvas. So, first question on the docket might be, why do I want to stretch a canvas? So, you might be familiar with canvases like this that come from an art store, you know, or you can even find things like this at Joann's or Michael's craft stores as well. Uh, this represents an 18 by 24 inch canvas, which is pre-stretched, meaning that it's already been primed with gesso and it's stretched across the back. So the wooden um, segments that are on the back of this canvas, uh, that's what we refer to as stretcher bars. And they come in a couple different varieties. But in a nutshell, the reason you want to stretch your own canvas is it can be a huge money saving uh, option for you. So. A small canvas or something relatively small like this, a mid-format canvas like an 18 by 24 inch, is not that much more to buy um, pre-stretched. But when you start getting larger, say in the neighborhood of uh, 24 by 36 inches, it's a whole lot cheaper to actually stretch your own canvas. And there's a huge advantage in stretching your own canvas because you can also get the kind of priming coat, the kind of gessoed layer that you might prefer you can get the um, different kinds of texture in the canvas, for example, and you can also um, kind of control the materials uh, a lot more than what you might get in this commercial canvas. So this is a Dick Blick uh, canvas, quite uh, inexpensive, um, and serves its purposes, especially for a lot of students. Um, but let's take our canvas stretching uh, to another level. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about um, how to stretch today on heavy duty stretcher bars. So um, I showed you that pre-stretched canvas and here you can see we've got the, the standard stretcher bars. And um, they work fine for smaller canvases, anything under 24 inches, not that big of a deal. When you start getting into a larger format and you want a larger profile for your work, something like 36 inches, uh, stretcher bars like this tend to bow quite frequently. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a painting that's bowed from corner to corner. That's due to um, really basically just using inferior quality um, materials. These are a lot more cost effective. I'm not saying that they're wrong. There's a lot of even professional painters that use these kind of profile stretchers, but I find them uh, pretty limiting in really what you can do. And uh, I think it's just worth the little bit of extra investment to uh, purchase the heavy duty stretcher bars. So here's an example. So you can see um, there's quite a bit of difference, you know, in, in terms of uh, um, the strength that these heavy duty stretcher bars can, can cost you. If you buy these in bulk, you can save a lot of money. Um, and the advantage of these heavy duty stretcher bars, as I'll show you in a moment, actually gives you a really nice long profile on the corner of your stretcher bar here. And a lot of painters, it's becoming more and more popular, just paint this edge of their work and they don't necessarily worry about throwing it in a frame. Something like this, it's a little harder to get away with that kind of treatment and you'll find that you'll need um, a frame in most cases. So even though these are a little bit more of an initial investment, if you get into the student art show, for example, this is a huge advantage because you're going to have um, a wider profile here that you can just end up painting. So, let's take a quick little detour and talk about the tools that are necessary. Um, first of all, you're going to need a hammer. All these are um, located in the painting studio for your use. Um, this is a tack remover, which is a good tool to have. I'll demonstrate that. Not necessarily um, needed for stretching canvas, but it's, it's a good thing to have. You're going to need a pair of scissors. Um, those came directly from the dollar store, you know, so it doesn't have to be anything spectacular. And um, I really recommend this Black & Decker Power Shot um, staple gun. The reason being, if you have small hands and it's kind of hard um, using a standard staple gun to um, compress uh, the staple into your stretcher bars. So the nice thing here is it's a little bit more of a user-friendly design, a little bit more ergonomic, if you will. Um, <laughs> every quarter this is what happens, right? I have students that come up and they start stapling like this and they think that the gun is broken or that there's no staples coming. So notice right here we've got an arrow 
on the front of the staple gun. Likewise, there's an arrow coming down here. But if you remember to use your index finger, insert your index finger through the hole here, then you have easy access to using that staple gun. And so it drives out this side. And uh, these are about 20 or so dollars at Home Depot if you want to invest in your own um, really great staple gun that last you a long time. Um, we need to talk about how to load this staple gun. The way that happens is there's a little clip right here. And you end up pushing that clip down and this plunger mechanism will come out. Let me go ahead and unload this. Oh, there's only a couple staples in there. So let me unload that and I'll show you on how to load the staple gun. Um, you take the staples like so and you're going to feed them through this back part of the staple gun teeth down first and you'll just slide that right down there. You do have to be careful if you fill them up with too many staples um, you won't get the plunger to, to attach to the unit. So once that's done you just slip this mechanism right back on here, lock it in place, lock and load, you're ready to go. Okay. So that's how you actually load the staple gun uh, for use while you're stretching your canvas. Um, just a little heads up, we'll be getting there soon. You're going to need um, some gesso. This again comes out of student fees. You don't have to pay for the gesso. We'll talk a little bit more about this in depth here in a minute. Um, that's Utrecht gesso. You're going to need a paintbrush as well. And um, also some blocks of wood make the priming part of this task a little bit more user friendly as well. So, those are the materials you'll need to get going. Have a square, and so we're gonna end up using that square to um, line up our stretcher bars. So if you're using the heavy duty stretcher bars or the thinner standard size stretcher bars, they assemble the same way. Um, what you're gonna wanna do is um, pound these corners together. If you're working a really large stretcher, um, I find it a little bit easier to you know, take your stretcher bar, set them down on the floor, but for the sake of this demonstration, we're going to do uh, a 15 by 20 inch stretcher. So that's another advantage. I mean, the cool thing is when you learn how to stretch your own canvas, you can come up with any size stretcher you want, especially if you have some wood making um, skills. You don't necessarily have to buy these stretcher bars. The advantage of these stretcher bars is the fact that they've been kiln dried, they won't warp um, as much as if you create your own stretcher bars. If you do feel the need to create your own stretcher bars, um, you'll probably notice here there's a little bit of a ridge on the front of the stretcher bar. If you want to create your own, if you say have your own table saw, when you run that um, wood uh, through your table saw, you're going to want to cut it in an angle so the canvas doesn't rest on the whole distance of the stretcher bar. If you don't have a loop like this, what's going to happen uh, as you paint, you're going to end up having the corner of your stretcher bar break through your whole painting and you won't be able to get rid of that little uh, annoying line that will right, wrap right around there. Sometimes I have students that ask me, can I just go buy a 2x4? Well, you sure can. I mean, it may warp on you a little bit. Um, something like poplar works a lot better. Um, some people end up using um, masonry molding. Uh, that also works because it has a, a bevel on it just like so. Um, but again, um, by the time you buy the wood, mill the wood, um, my experience is there's not a really a huge cost saving measure in, in, in making your own. Okay. So, I also have students that are afraid to pound them together. They're like, oh, are they going to see what happens? If it breaks a little bit, if it cracks a little bit, no harm, no foul. Nobody's going to end up seeing what's going on here because it's going to be covered by canvas. Okay, so now that we've got this squared up, I'm going to take this square and... I'm going to push to the right or to the left okay, to kind of square off the canvas. We're looking pretty good. That was a <laughs> pretty good guess, actually. All right, so we are 
we're, we're plenty good to go. So now that we have that done, what I do is I don't glue the stretcher bars together. Some painters do, some painters recommend it. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, rather what I do is I just drive in one staple just like that in each of the following corners. Okay. Um, so I'll just drive one staple in each of the four sides. Just like so, um, a hammer is additionally handy. If that staple doesn't go in all the way, okay? So now our stretcher bars are ready to go. Um, you want to make sure that you place the side with the, with the relief edge facing the canvas straight down on your cutting surface, okay? So now we're going to come in, we're going to grab the scissors. You don't have to be real exact on this, um, but what you do need to make sure of is that you're going to have enough material that's going to extend over the edge of your stretcher bar and onto your surface. So in case you want to paint the edge of your canvas, you have that option. Um, you might be asking what kind of canvas works. Um, I actually buy my canvas from a, a boat and awning supplier in Salt Lake City, um, pretty cheap. A lot cheaper than what you'll pay at the art store. Um, places like Joann's and Michael's and such will also carry canvas, even Walmart. Um, and what I recommend getting is something that's been untreated, which most canvases are. Uh, a cotton duck canvas. Anything that's eight ounces on up works. Eight ounces is a little thin. I really like nine or an 11 ounce or maybe a 12 ounce. I think this is a 12 ounce canvas. Works really well. When you start getting around an 18 ounce canvas, it's kind of hard to stretch. It takes a lot of hand strength and it's, there's not really, in my opinion, any kind of advantage of moving beyond, say, a 12 ounce canvas. Um, but generally speaking, you can find better deals on canvas outside the art store. You go to an art store, you end up spending a lot. So um, do a little bit of footwork. Uh, visit local vendors and you're going to find probably a better deal. All you need is a cotton duck canvas and uh, um, it's pretty straightforward. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just make sure I've got enough room to go all the way around. Um, so I'm just going to simply cut this canvas right here. Okay, Just give myself a, enough canvas. Uh, in fact, I've got enough left over here to stretch another canvas. So, um, always save your scraps if they're big enough to, to, to stretch another canvas with. All right, now that we've got this, again, with the beveled side laying down, you're going to always want to start with your longest distance. In this case, I'm going to start with the longest distance, which is 20 inches. For most students, you're going to be approaching this for your micro-macro assignment. You're going to need um, a 24 by 36 inch stretcher bar. So your longest distance will be this 36 inch stretcher bar. Same thing holds true. Whatever your longest distance is, you're going to want to drive a staple dead center into that longer bar, just like so. How are we doing, Christian? Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. So you're going to go ahead and drive that uh, staple dead center right in the center of the stretcher bar. And you don't really need to pull super tight, especially if you're using those thin stretcher bars. Because if you pull too tight, you're going to increase your chance of ripping the canvas. Um, you're also going to probably warp it a little bit. You can actually get pretty aggressive with this, with the heavier duty stretcher bars. The one probably easiest thing to remember when you're stretching canvas, if you can remember this one concept, you're going to be in really good shape. And that's that you always want to work in opposites. So you can see that I drove a staple right here into the center of the stretcher bar. And then I went and proceeded to the opposite side. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and move to the opposite side of the stretcher bar. And I'm going to drive a staple right here on this opposite side. I'm going to pull it snug. Okay, not too hard, 
but hard enough to try to keep all the wrinkles out. And even if you have a piece of canvas that has wrinkles, has some imperfections and things like that, it's not a big deal because we're eventually going to cover it up with the gesso and that will cover up any of the wrinkles. It will actually pull them out as you stretch them. Okay, so don't be afraid, again, to pull uh, or to hammer any of those staples that might not necessarily have gone into the stretcher bar all the way. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to proceed to go ahead and drive in two staples um, about an inch or so apart. Sometimes I'll have students that will like, you know, they'll drive in a thousand staples. Um, something in this neighborhood is, is pretty healthy, you know, anywhere from like an inch to an inch and a half. You could even go as far as two inches before you drive in another staple. Um, but what I'm doing each time I staple, I grab this canvas, I'm pushing it forward, and I'm pushing it towards the closest corner. So in other words, I'm pushing it down, and I'm pushing it over towards the closest corner. So what I'm really trying to do is eliminate any kind of wrinkles here on the side of the canvas as I'm progressing on my stretching. So I'm going to go ahead and drive in another staple. I'm going to move to this other side, all right? Now since I went on the right-hand side, I'm going to move to the left-hand side. So again, if you can remember the one simple um, rule of thumb when you're stretching canvas, always work in opposites. So again, trying to pull that snug, keep it free of any kind of wrinkles. I also have a lot of students that then continue to only work two sides of the canvas. That's a mistake, okay? What you want to do you want to work all four corners of the canvas at the same time. All right, so what I'm going to do is move to this side, drive a couple of staples into the left-hand side, which means I'm going to end up working on the opposite side when I get over here. Okay. Two staples at a time. I'll just continue to progress all the way around. Now this is especially important when you're working a very large canvas. It's a little more forgiving on a smaller canvas, but if you worked a four by five foot canvas, for example, you didn't follow that format, you're going to find yourself getting in some trouble. So make sure, just out of habit, that you follow this progression. Okay? So I'll go ahead and just quickly finish this up. When you start to approach the corners, you want to leave yourself about three inches gap. So don't staple all the way over. If you end up stapling all the way over, you're going to have a really hard time making your fold. Here I'm leaving a little bit of room, a little bit of room here so I can make my fold eventually. And that's actually, truth be told, the hardest part of stretching canvas. I'm going to be stretching that, that corner um, properly. That's where the biggest learning curve tends to be for students. Might throw in one more right over here. All right, we're in excellent shape. You can see the, strut, the front of the canvas is starting to, to look like a canvas you might want to paint on. So uh, we're cruising. I come back to the scissors now, and I go ahead and uh, elect to give a little haircut to my canvas. Go ahead and cut off any of this extra canvas, um, especially around the corners. So you can trim it. I try to trim it fairly close to the staples. It cuts down on the frame. Sometimes you can exhibit, and if you have a long piece of canvas on the back, you're going to get threads like this running across the back of the painting, and it just looks kind of amateurish. So it doesn't hurt to come back in with the scissors, dress the back of your canvas a little bit. Okay. And additionally, it's really important. This is an important step. You also want to cut the extra canvas 
off the edge of the corners here. So once you've trimmed those sides of the canvas, you're good to go. You can actually now move to the next step. So this one is debatably the most challenging. What we're going to do is we're going to learn how to do a fold. Um, it's very similar to the hospital bed fold. I don't know why anybody want, would want rather to make their bed that way. Ugh, like having your ankles crushed under the sheets. I just hate that, you know. So anyway, some of you might end up doing that. But um, makes me think of an old Seinfeld episode if you've seen that one. I, I don't know if I want to compare myself to George Costanza, but kind of like George, I don't like the tight corners. But anyhow, I do like tight corners on my canvases. So here's how you end up making your, your folds. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to take um, your index finger, grab the corner of the canvas, and pull it down towards the ground, wherever um, um, that might be. So if you're going like this, you can, again, pinch that, grab it tight, and push it down towards the ground. Okay, that's going to create what I call the first flap. Okay, so if you take this material that's left right here, pinch it tight, fold it over, then you can take this remaining flap, and sometimes you need to adjust it a little bit with your fingers. Okay, you can have a hard time seeing that. Um, what you do is sometimes you might need to just make a slight adjustment. Right now I'm just taking my fingers and I'm twisting that canvas just a little bit. And if you do that fold, correctly, what you're going to find is that you're going to have just a, almost looks like it's a seamless fold, but you're actually hiding the seam right up against the corner of the canvas, and you'll have, and I doubt the camera can pick this up, you're going to find a little triangle folded underneath the corner here. And what that allows is just one little seam here, and, we, and when we end up putting a bead of gesso down over that corner, you'll have no idea that there's even really a seam there. So, drive in a couple of staples, and I, I promise you, like when you're doing the corners of your canvas, that always seems to be when you run out of staples. So, sometimes I reload at this point. Okay, but now we've got this corner right here fixed. So, again, sound like a broken record probably, but what you're going to do is you're going to move to this other opposite corner. Okay, so we're going to, again, Put my fingers down in here using the index finger, pinching it kind of tight. I'm going to pull it down towards the ground. Okay, and again, opposite corners, leaving this flap. Pinch that flap, flap over, and then I'm going to use my fingers to adjust the remaining canvas. Uh, most students struggle with this. That's to be expected. I'll come around. I'll give you a hand with your corners, um, but. Once you get the corners down, no problem. If you have a little extra material, you can snip it off. Um, but that's a pretty nice looking corner right there. So I've got these opposite corners done. I'll just go ahead and move back over here and uh, repeat the same process. And it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, uh, a little tricky at first maybe. Once you get it down, you, you can do it without thinking. And when you get really proficient at stretching canvas, um, You'll ask yourself, like, why you want to buy a canvas, at least I do. I really, actually really enjoy stretching canvas. I think there's something about it that's kind of, kind of relaxing. And uh, quickly you have a result, which is nice. So Anyway, I'm going to finish off this last corner. And again, keep in mind, you can also buy a canvas that's pre gessoed I don't recommend it. Um, it's harder to stretch with. Okay. So there we go. The hardest part's over. We have a very nice canvas. Um, looks like it's pretty well wrinkle-free. We've got maybe just a little buckling on this corner. Um, the gesso will take that right out, so I'm not worried about it at all. But looks great. Um, nicely stretched. Um, so, 
we're just down to doing our finishing coat of gesso. So gesso might be a little unfamiliar to a lot of you, but it's um, not a whole lot different than, um, say, house paint. Uh, what you might use, something like Kills or other name brands you can buy at a hardware store. Um, it's basically the same idea if you're painting a house and you want to put a layer of a, a kill coat down or a priming layer. Um, only in, in art, it's extremely important um, because, for example, if I was to then move on to this canvas and oil paint, um, without priming it, we would have a real issue. Um, the issue would be, from an archival standpoint, you would end up um, having the oil paint eat through the canvas and uh, you wouldn't have any kind of a matrix protecting or any kind of a surface rather protecting uh, your paint. So this gesso is incredibly important and um, one thing you want to do before you start pre-saturate your brush. So have your brush, your brush bristles really wet and damp um, I've already done that. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to pop open the gesso. And uh, really good gesso, the more expensive the gesso, the thicker it is. So this is a student grade gesso. Though it's made by Utrecht, which is the only company I would recommend buying gesso from. Uh, from a cost standpoint, from a quality standpoint, they're far and above the best. Um, so you're going to take your brush. Um, some artists also use rollers. Recently, I've started rollering my canvas. I like the smooth texture, which has been a huge change. I used to really like a coarse canvas, but this is what's fun. You can actually set your own kind of texture on the canvas. So whether you want a really thick tooth to work into or a thin tooth, um, this is what you use the gesso for. So the gesso actually um, has marble dust in it, and the more expensive the gesso, um, if you get up to the professional, the Utrecht professional layer, it's about $50 a gallon, but it's really thick, so it lasts a long time. Uh, this is student grade gesso, and it's, it's about $18 a gallon. So um, it's provided for you thanks to your student fees. You don't need to purchase any, and you can see how I'm using the blocks. That makes our job here a little bit easier. Um, and don't forget to also finish the sides of your canvas. Okay? Sometimes you might find it a little bit easier to paint your sides first. This gives me the opportunity to cover up um, any of those uh, seams that we discussed earlier. Okay. So, you just proceed to gesso your canvas, and why, why I'm doing that, I'll tell you an interesting little story about gesso. Um, back in the time of Rembrandt, rather than using acrylic based gesso, like what we have, meaning the binding agent or the glue, what holds this together is, is, is a plastic, all right, uh, meaning the acrylic. So um, back in Rembrandt's time, they ended up using um, rabbit skin glue and they would, bile, they would boil down different formulas um, and that's what they would bind their canvas with to keep the, the oil paints from eating through the the surface. Now if you were to paint with acrylic paint, you wouldn't necessarily have to gesso or prime your canvas like what we're doing now, but you would end up using a lot of paint. That's another advantage of the gesso is it will allow you to use less paint um, when you're actually working on your surface. So here we go. I'm finishing up the, the canvas. Um, you can actually, some painters will do something like this where they paint in a pattern where you go one direction, you allow it to dry, and then you can cross hatch it in a following direction, and that will kind of mimic the texture of the canvas. Um, some people will lay it on really, really thick, and it gives it more of an impressionist kind of background, so you're already working into a painted surface. Um, these blocks of wood, uh, little blocks of wood rather, really help in terms of your cleanup. Um, makes it a lot easier to clean up. So um, they're a handy thing to have. And you'll find them in the painting studio. But got a little bit on a little bit of a tangent there and sidetracked in just a hair. So let me come back and uh, tell you a little bit about Rembrandt. So Rembrandt um, arguably his most famous painting, the Night Watch, which is in the Rijksmuseum in, in Amsterdam. 
was attacked by a severely mentally ill individual September 12th, 1975. And uh, he came in with a sharp blade and actually cut and slashed the painting several times for a security guard was able to, able to tackle this guy. And uh, the cool thing about the gesso and the rabbit skin glue of its day is that archivists can actually separate that very thin layer off the canvas. So, um, you know, 300 years from now when you're famous and you're hanging in a museum or your posterity wants to keep your painting, an archivist can actually remove this layer of gesso off the canvas, attach it to another layer of canvas, and um, you'd be set uh, for another couple hundred years. You know, and they could put new stretcher bars on there and uh, preserve the artwork. And there's people out there that are, you know, work full time, and that's what they do. They uh, um, preserve art history for future generations. So. Um, that happened to Rembrandt's Night Watch, and thankfully the individual that, that went in and slashed the painting used a really sharp knife, and restorators were actually able to separate that layer of gesso, they replaced the stretcher bars, and they pieced the painting back together, and there was just these little tiny seams that ran down through the painting, and they ended up painting those seams. And um, I haven't seen it in person yet, but I've heard that you can't even really tell that the original damage was there. And it's a, it's a painting with a real checkered history. Not far after that happened, somebody else, believe it or not, came by and threw acid across the uh, work of art. So I don't know, it's not really a, con a controversial work of art by any extreme, but it's had its run-ins for sure. Okay, so. Once you're done gessoing it, the next step is to work on getting all the gesso out of your brush. Okay, you can do one thick layer, you can do two thin layers, it's kind of all personal preference, it's up to you. At this point though, it's nice to have a piece of newsprint around. You can work out as much gesso as you can out of the brush. Once you get most of the gesso out of the brush, then go to a, a sink, you're going to rinse out the brush and you're good to go. Um, to, you probably do need to wait, I should state, this is crucial. Um, I prefer to wait about 24 hours prior to painting on the gesso surface. Um, so, if you're stretching this for a class, it's going to take a little bit um, of preparation. Okay? Um, there is one tool sitting here on the table I failed to mention, and that's the tack remover tool. So, in case you make a mistake when you're stretching your canvas, or if you want to take a canvas apart and restretch on top of it, which is totally um, an acceptable practice, especially if you're a starving student eating top ramen, you're going to want to end up using those stretcher bars as often as possible. Um, so take your tack remover tool, you're going to just put that right under the staple and you're going to be able to remove that staple with this tool. So I just wanted to make sure I uh, address that item um, as well because I I didn't do that earlier. But that's it. You should have all the knowledge uh, and, uh, based on this little tutorial to get you started on stretching your own canvas. Um, one other thing for some of the more advanced uh, uh, students as you're starting to paint even larger, you do need a reinforcement every 24 inches on the back of your stretcher bars if you're to paint at a museum standard. Um, and so uh, if you're going to start selling your work, if you're going to start exhibiting it, you're going to want to have museum standard uh, stretcher bars. And so this canvas isn't that large, but if I was working a little bit larger, the rule of thumb would be every 24 inches to have a cross support. And what I end up using is a poplar, and you can buy um, pre-milled poplar at Lowe's or Home Depot and uh, reinforce that in the back of your stretcher bars. Um, it's something you can't do with those lighter um, quality stretcher bars either. So, um, something to keep in mind when you're progressing in your advancement stretching canvas, just make sure you have a reinforcement about every 24 inches. Anyway, that concludes this lecture. Um, know I'm around to give you a hand if you need it. Thank you very much.